Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let, thank you. Thank you. Let me ask, how many Debian developers have we got in the room? One, two, three, four, yay, five, brilliant, good. Um, so uh, I, what this presentation was, was what I gave at DevConf in Geneva about uh, three, four months ago, updated with some new information that's happened since then. Um, it's basically, although uh, I, should, I should tell you the agenda of what I'm going through. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about who I am. Um, most people here, I'm gonna assume, know what Amazon Web Services is, so that'll be very, very brief. Um, of course, I'm happy to take any questions, but maybe the AWS stuff, which is more generic, I'm, let's do that afterwards, and I can go into as much detail as you wish. Um, and then a, a couple of the projects that I've done. This is very much a talk from the perspective of a Debian developer, not the talk of an Amazon person. So here I'm talking above the hypervisor. Um, so let's kick through this. Um, I've been a Debian user since about 95 and a developer since 2000. Um, various things that I've done. Welcome back, Nathan. All good? Am I too loud? Ah, oh, that one. Um, and, and most of the reason why I've become a Debian developer is because um, uh, some kind soul here at the University of Western Australia set up a Debian mirror in the uh, mid-90s. And so there was fast access to a very good Linux distribution, um, and I got addicted. Um, I did a BCM here at UWA, mostly uh, hanging out at the UCC. So for those that don't know, the computer club here on campus is the place where you go to break machines and put them back together again. Um, and then I worked here at UWA for a couple of years as a chief webmaster. Um, I ran LCA 2003 here in Perth, uh, and I've convinced some unsuspecting bystanders to do LCA 2014. Result. So welcome back, everybody. Um, I was at DebConf 1, uh, 7 and 13 just gone. Um, anyone else here at DebConf 1 with me? No? Yes? You may be in there. Uh, the, yes, there you are, Russ. Down there. Many, many years ago. We, we were less grey then. Um, and a, a bunch of people. Mm. Um, so uh, what else? Uh, oh, I'm married and got a little boy who's Oscar. You may have seen wandering around about two hours ago. Uh, and I'm now working for AWS. So I, I'm based here in Perth. Um, I've worked for Amazon for about a year and a half. But as I said before, this talk is about uh, being a Debian developer and trying to um, make things better. Because for a long time, it's been hard to find uh, Debian AMIs on AWS um, and knowing which ones you're going to trust. And that's a, a pretty strong theme here. Um, so AWS uh, overview. It's uh, a collection of remote computing services. Uh, anyone here not used AWS at all? Ever? A couple? OK. That's understandable, God, um, but well. <laughs> um, so uh, it's compute, it's storage, um, and obviously to put those two together, it's a bit of networking as well, plus actually now a whole bunch of services which leverage on top of that. So managed databases, transcode at scale, message queue at scale, um, and more and more all the time. Um, but of course, it's also doing things like supply chain logistics, um, operational excellence, certifications and audits. Obviously, this is very important in, in lieu of this morning's debate and discussion. Um, uh, operating at a massive scale, doing it for as many people as possible, and still trying to drive down the prices of all of that. Um, and especially with regards to certifications and audits, they can be expensive and timely to do. Um, so it's useful that you can just ask us for the certification for the physical infrastructure. Us, I should have said Amazon, because I'm not in that mood right now. So right now, uh, it's also a place where customers get to choose what software they're going to run. Um, and there's a whole bunch of uh, Linux distributions and Windows versions that customers can run on there. Uh, and for a long time, um, there's, as I said before, there's not been a choice of an official or blessed Debian image to run on AWS. Um, and I know when I got started, that was what I was looking for, looking for something that I trusted over the last sort of 15, 20 years, um, and it wasn't there. So I thought, right, we're going to have to fix that. What, what little bits and pieces can I now do that I'm in, potentially empowered to do by being in both camps? Um, so let's have a quick look at some of the things that have been doing. I'm going to start with the thing that actually was already happening, and I just happened to um, chance upon after I started. And it was recompiling the Debian uh, archive on AWS at scale, um, looking for bugs and trying to fix this in. This is not my project at all. Um, I am definitely uh, standing on the shoulders of uh, Lucas Nasbaum, our current DPL, um, and a couple of other people who have been working on uh, automating this. Um, effectively, uh, we've done a couple of grants to an account and they've managed to go out and uh, take advantage of AWS to recompile it. And they've done it for two reasons. Um, they were looking for uh, bugs in packages during compilation time. 
And inversely, they were looking for bugs in compilers. So revert that, take the same package, and use different revisions of compilers different times. Uh, and the uh, CLANG project, Clang project um, recently has been doing a lot of testing by recompiling and finding out that new versions of Clang have surfaced new bugs and then resolved bugs. So um, doing that against a, a nice uniform repository of some 40,000 packages is a pretty good test load to throw it at. Um, so they've been making use of, of what AWS has called spot instances, um, which is effectively, let's call it the excess capacity that's already spun up and running. Um, and I know a couple of people here have actually played with uh, Spot recently and um, uh, have had a pretty good experience. It's not for your long-term compute. Um, the idea is that if we've got servers already at AWS spun up, um, it's normally, let's say, a dollar an hour, whatever it happens to be. But if it's not in use, just give us a bid. And if it, you might get it. But if the market dries up, all of the spare instances that are allocated to the Spot market are, are no longer available, then the market price goes up. And if your maximum bid price is below the current market price, then your instance might get terminated. Gone. You know, this wouldn't be for your most important database server. But for something like a compile farm, it's brilliant. Uh, you know, it could be 90, 95% more cheaper than the normal price. Um, and so the, although these grant price uh, numbers have had some pretty high numbers against them, I think in uh, the first year they struggled to spend about $2,000 on us, um, firing up as much as possible. Um, so uh, uh, Lucas's blog here talks all about this, and I'd recommend if, you, if you're interested in doing sort of compile farm stuff. Russ? How much resource does it take to do one uh, compile or archive? I don't know. Um, I, I haven't looked back to see exactly how much they use. All I know is they came back and said, yeah, we had this grant, we only spent that much. Can we have some more? Um, because it expires over years, so I've gone back every year to, uh, to so give them enough. Oh, it's 2,000. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, I don't know which sizes of instances they were using or items like that. Um, but it's been a nice thing that we've actually got a mass bug filing out of this project effectively on not just Clang, but also back the other way on the packages that failed to build from source and, and uh, other little warnings that have come up that have been ignored by the build system over time. So what happens if you get, sorry, if you're about to get evicted? What happens if you're about to get evicted? You get grace period. You get Thunderbirds, go! So in principle, we're told to tell customers no. In practice, you get an ACPI shutdown with a timer going off. So um, the idea with Spot is if you can check some your code and save it outside of your instance over time, then your recovery time is quite small. Um, but effectively, it goes along, away. Yeah, yeah, no, it's Amazon's funding this. So I'm, I'm sitting on the inside of Amazon saying, we should help out like this, and we should help out like this, and hey, let's see if we can get that working. So um, this, this is, uh, yes, the third year that we've done this. I think we just gave it to, to the guys about uh, two months ago. Um, so they're up and running again. Um, uh, the spot price of instances does change over time. That's just a graph of what the price was. So you can see it's, at, when I looked at this, it was 79 to 88% cheaper than the normal pricing, but that's kind of why you look at this for this kind of workload. It's not something people normally look at first off, but this was an awesome application for it. Um, oh, there were some stats they gave me. Um, so 12 complete archives have been done. So 480 package builds, uh, of 480,000 it should be, um, and a whole bunch of bugs, fixes, and this was back in uh, March, I think, that I... No, that was uh, November um, that I got those stats out. Um, and the Clang stuff, this was against um, very over time as new versions of Clang was coming out. Um, there is a video from DebConf this year where uh, I think it was Sylvester was talking exactly about this project, how he was doing it. Um, so I'd recommend you go and have a look at the DebConf videos that was in uh, Geneva um, because it was pretty interesting. Cool. That was the first thing. It was a pretty ni ni nice little neat project that, that happened. I had nothing to do with it other than the guy said, hey, can we get some more credits for it? So um, the next thing was accelerating ftp.debian.org. Um, I started this by trying to get uh, fast access for Debian mirrors inside AWS regions. Um, and I went along and created a, a small server with some ephemeral storage that would rsync from a remote uh, FTP site and then push it into S3 for storage. And I figured this was actually going to be easy, what I ended up doing. Um, I turned around and used uh, Amazon's uh, CloudFront CDN. Um, the side effect of this is this is available to you now um, from wherever you happen to be. Um, there are, well, this is one slide I've not updated in the last uh, day. There's now 51 points of presence. Um, in fact, today, this morning, we opened up in Taipei and Rio de Janeiro for CloudFront. There's nothing anyone needs to do to use that. If you're geographically close to those locations, 
and you want to try cloudfront.debian.net, then it'll come through for you and you'll be getting accelerated usage. Um, the idea was to speed up archive for in-region and also to reduce load on Debian's external FTP network. There are a large number of machines that start up and go away and the load that they could potentially generate as we start to do more and more inside AWS um, was something I didn't want to be a, a burden on the external mirrors, uh, the, the people who kindly provide the services to make that work. Um, now, generally what I've been doing is I've been uh, leveraging http.debian.net, which is Debian's own, nothing to do with AWS, Debian's redirection service um, for sending you to your closest mirror site for, uh, for archive access. Um, as it happens, uh, I am blanking on the name of the person uh, who runs that, um, but if you're in an AWS region, he's basically mapped it that if you're coming from that IP address range, then he'll try and send you to cloudfront.debian.net, which will then obviously go to the closest location in the same region. So effectively, you're getting zero cost access to the archive. There's no data transfers going on there. But it's not from here. No, not from, well, if, well you aren't going to pay for it anyway because it's coming out of my account. So it's free access, cloudfront.debian.net. In fact, one of the nice things is it's got multiple behaviors, as you'll see in a second. So there's actually a large amount of stuff. You can... No, so from, from here, it'll probably send you to IINet's uh, mirror or the West Australian Internet Association's mirror at Wakes um, or something like that. So we found that, that um, actually nowadays, I can't remember if it's a default or if it's something we were putting into uh, the previous images we were generating. Um, it was just use http.debian.net and it will work out at runtime to connect you to the closest mirror. Um, unfortunately, the upstream sites that I'm using, so I'm using the uh, ftp.debian.org over HTTP as my upstream site, doesn't add any cache control information about how long files in the archive can be cached for. Um, and by default, uh, CloudFront will cache objects for 24 hours. In lieu of anything being put as a, an appropriate HTTP header, 24 hours is what it's chosen. Um, but some of our files in the archive need to be pretty fresh. So index files, trace files, timestamp files, they get updated multiple times per day. So caching that on edge locations in 51 locations now is not suitable. Um, so I wanted to try and find out a way to work around that, and I did. Um, CloudFront supports what we call behaviors. It's basically path mapping. A specific path under cloudfront.w.net can go somewhere else. And this is the configuration page that I've got there at the moment. Um, one of the things that I think is going to be quite interesting, which I was thinking about when I was looking at you, Bob, before, was um, Debian CD at the top there. So if you go cloudfront.debian.net slash debian-cd, you'll actually be pulling from the Debian CD archive, which is held at, anyone? Somewhere in Europe? Finland? I can't remember. Um, CDs? That's what you used to put ISO images onto. <laughs> uh, but also backports I pulled in there. Obviously, backports now is merged into the main archive, um, but old backports you can grab through here as well. So, uh, and CD image. Um, so you can basically grab most of the large content you want through a CDN so it'll be accelerated. Now, currently in Australia, there is only one point of presence. It's in Sydney. Um, there may be more in the future, um, but it's growing rapidly, as you saw just earlier with two opening today. And in fact, um, the 42 number I had there was the number at August the 10th or so, so what's that, four months ago, we've gone up by another um, nine, eight spots or so of, of CloudFront Edge locations. Okay, so this is a, yeah. this is a pull through cache. It is a, it's, it's basically a proxy cache, yeah. So first hit will have a, a, a cost on it, but after that, object files will have that 24-hour um, cache, but the index files are making hot. So let me show you how the mapping actually works. We have an Edge location somewhere in the world, geographically close to an end user, and uh, the rule mapping is that the root of it goes to an S3 bucket. So if you hit, if anyone's got a laptop there, hit cloudfront.debian.net and you should see a page that says, hey, this is CloudFront uh, for um, the Debian archive. You could probably click on these sub URLs, these paths below. And that's just a static file sitting in an S3 bucket. Pretty simple. Um, and that can be cached for as long as we want. I think I've got a TTL set in the object in the bucket, um, just in case I go and update it. Um, but it's, it's ultimately cacheable. The next thing I've got is any path that comes into CloudFront that says cloudfront.debian.net slash Debian slash whatever, um, I just send straight off to ftp.debian.org, as in cached through. No problem with that. But because uh, those objects that come back from there don't have any cache information on them, 
um, I wanted to actually add that in. So I thought I'm going to have to bring up a, some kind of interstitial server that sits between ftp.debian.org and CloudFront to add that header in. So that's exactly what I did. There is a micro sitting out there that all it does is receives a request, goes and gets the file from ftp.debian.org, adds the response header back on with a specific timeout, and sends it all back. Um, and that brought in the discussion of, well, how hot should these files be? I mean, we don't want to add a zero second timeout on something like an index file, because we have now 51 locations, and they do do collapsed forwarding from each edge location. So one request will come through. Um, but there's a lot of files that get accessed, especially PDF files. You know, everyone familiar with PDF files? There's lots of them. Um, I think AJ's working on a patch to do something interesting with PDF files at the moment. They should be uniquely named. Yes, they should be. They're OK. Yes, and releases and, and anything that's got to check something with the same file name. Yes, you're right, you're right. And, and you'll see that in the, the mapping that's coming through. Um, and of course, anything that goes to Debian CD, well, there's none. Uh, you know, Debian CD, I'm happy with 24 hours. How often do CD images update? Once every, well, yes, point of shame, three years. No, every, every couple of often, uh, months when there's a new update. But that's on a new path, so it doesn't matter. Um, and Debian Archive, so old releases you can pull through CloudFront. Um, and we do that via 51 locations as of today. Um, so there can be some traffic, uh, which is why I say here we just opened in Taipei this, uh, yes, Taipei this morning, um, and in Rio. Yay, more points, nothing to do. Let's look at the configuration for the little interstitial box. Anyone want to guess what web server it's running? Yeah. Um, so that's a, 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 a headers, basically, header configuration. So based on certain paths, um, certain timeouts are set. So 15 minutes for some stuff, five minutes for others that I want even hotter. And in fact, taking that down to the full list, that's kind of what we've ended up on as to how hot we want some of these paths to be. 10 seconds at the most extreme, 15 minutes at the least for the stuff which is volatile going through that interstitial server. Should we change it? That's yeah. honestly a question. I have no idea. Some, some questions. Yeah. Um, it has to be on the header of the object it's fetching back. So you can't, do the you can't set a maximum TTL, you can only set a minimum TTL. Oh, okay. Yeah. Whereas this is the way to get the maximum TTL at the moment. Um, I've had, obviously, uh, when I first set this up, and I, I actually first set this up as, um, as Wheezy was going out the door, thinking, let's just see what we can do to help, you know, even if it's only for a short period. And I hit this and went, oh, I've got to do something more interesting to make this actually work. Um, yes? What thing, sorry? Really good question. I did put it onto the, uh, the mirror mailing list and asked for it, and I heard. And I wanted to get this working within hours. I've just done it. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's easy for you to say that, but if you understand that there's mirror network, of which Debian doesn't run most of them, yeah. some other third party asks the data, and then it's theirs. Have some knowledge of the files and what the files are meant to do. If you know when the mirror pops, is, when, the, when the, the archive push is going to go, then you know what the validity of a particular package file is, and we can nail that to a particular date. But then I was finding that actually. That on HTTP .debian .org, but then that's not going to do anything on mirror.arnet. No, but I'm only pulling from one server. You are. That's, that's nice. Um, it could be a recommended setting or a. Why doesn't it happen on FTP .debian .org? So I'm trying to repeat little bits. Um, so uh, yeah, why don't we do it on the upstream mirrors? It would be great if we did. It would be nice if we could have it as a, a nice to have for the, the leaf nodes on there. Um, but this way, I've got control over it. And, and this is kind of what I've ended up at. Because I was finding files were updating more than four times a day. Um, so there's, there's quite a lot of churn that goes through there for some files. Um, anyway, so it was a legitimate question. Are these the right times? If you f uh, find that some of these files have been cached for too long, Please tell me, and we'll update this. This is only what I've gone through and, and sort of distilled down to at the moment. Um, so who's using CloudFront or Debian.net? Well, uh, um, as a Debian developer, not as Amazon, um, I'm logging how much CloudFront or Debian.net is being used, which is great. I have the logs. I haven't got the time to do anything with the logs. So I'm looking for a volunteer. Would anybody like to use AWS to analyze uh, large volumes of HTTP logs for this to give us a report and work out what's going on. 
Bod, yay, thank you very much. Bod was uh, uh, seconded there, so yes. We'll talk. Yeah, 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 you and me both. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping at some stage to do something with these logs. They, they're not AWS logging in, it's me as a Debian developer logging into it. And before any of that data goes anywhere, it'll be anonymized so that it's not identifiable, just to give us some idea of which regions of the world are more popular for this. We're the library. <sighs> the format... Yeah, it's going to be one of the two. Oh, it I started to do some of this um, using Hadoop, just because there is such, I mean, one process of all stats will be sitting there forever. Um, but it needs to be merged, and so there's a little bit more that needs to be done for that. So anyway, if anyone's got any time, in the future or now, just come and talk to me and we'll uh, see about doing something. Next, next thing, snapshot.tabin.org. Anyone here not heard of snapshot.tabin.org? Yay, a few people. So you guys know what a Debian package is? We know there's about 40,000 in the stable archive. How many have there ever been? Ever, ever, ever. Right, Snapshot has all of them. All the files. Yes? Yes, all the files. Yeah. Well, there's, there's a few that are missing over time. I mean, the sands of time have lost some. Um, effectively, it's 18 terabytes of Debian packages. Um, it's uh, hundreds and thousands of files. Um, they've been stored at, I believe it's the Welcome Sanger Institute, um, where snapshot.dev.org has been running from. Um, it's very useful if you're doing uh, bug bisection. If you have a bug, you know it's in the current version. When did it appear? I need to go and find back the previous revisions of that. And so um, it's basically, as they described it itself, it's a way back machine for packages. Um, ADT. It says 55,000 files. I'm sure there's a lot more than that. Uh, and then one Postgres database. The files are actually stored um, with basically GUIDs in the file name. Um, so uh, there's two digits slash two digits slash big long name. And that happens to correspond to something that's in the database, in the Postgres database, which is, well, that is, you know, uh, Apache worker 1.3 underscore whatever dot deb. Um, and so uh, I got approached saying, hey, this is starting to become quite large. Yes, question? Um, I don't know, because I, I didn't create Snapshot to start with. Um, so the question was, um, aren't package file names already unique? Yes, they are. Um, but they're not evenly distributed on a file system to start with, is what I can think of. Um, so if you're going to put them into a, I mean, if you look at the archive right now, uh, and you go into the pool, you see there's a folder called A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, lib A, lib B, yeah, because there's not an even distribution. Um, and so they were trying to be evenly distributed in the, the namespace of the objects which were being stored, which is a, a nice thing to do. Um, and so uh, I got approached saying, hey, look, this is starting to get quite large. Is there something better we can do? Um, corresponds nicely to the fact that obviously Amazon has this little storage service that a few people have heard of, um, S3. Um, but the newer one, which is the one which is, uh, I think, quite interesting for this project, is Glacier, the archive service. Um, and you know, these files aren't in frequent use. And if you want them, you probably don't need them immediately, but you could probably wait maybe a couple of hours for that file to be brought back to you. Um, so I looked at ingesting all of this, uh, and it was, I think, November that people started asking me. Um, yeah, they only need to be near, near the line so we can get them in a timely fashion. That timely fashion is, is roughly three to five hours. Um, and so what we do is we have Amazon S3, um, and we put all of the files into S3. Um, and there's nothing else we need to do because there's Glacier, and what S3 can do is with a timed policy, a lifecycle policy, it can automatically migrate files into Glacier. It still stays visible inside S3. Um, it's just if you try and access it, you get the appropriate HTTP response back saying, hey, that file is not currently available, in which case an authorized user can go and restore it for you. Um, and so that's the bit I'm going to come back. We get back the file. When you want it back, it brings it back into S3. It uses uh, the reduced redundancy service of S3, which is about 30% cheaper because it's a, a duplicate copy of the file that's back. You restore it for a number of days. So restore Apache 1.3, whatever, well gone now, um, for 30 days. And after 30 days, it just deletes the duplicate copy from live storage. Does that all make sense? It points, it has the file name, so just whatever host name and the file name and it goes together. So yes, effectively, yes. yeah. Right, so um, that works out when I looked at about 200 bucks a month to run that. 
Um, now, it took some time to ingest this data. The actual raw data I did by having a, a bunch of threads running at the Wellcome Sanger Institute. Um, started in November, finished on Sunday. Um, <laughs> pasted, that was actually the second pass that I finished on Sunday, so I'm pretty confident now we've got most files. Um, I've adjusted the policy so that as I was ingesting, files were being archived after three days. They're now being archived after, I think, nine, 180 days. So fresh stuff will still be very fresh. Um, and that's purely to keep any cost that's coming through on this quite low. I mean, Amazon's covering any of this anyway. But it's a, a good exercise, and it means that no one's really concerned about how big this gets. Um, but if I catch something that's been rotated off of the yes. storage from one of the better descriptions. I won't use that word, but yes. Yeah. It's been archived. It's been archived. What's the, does that trigger the copy back to S3? It doesn't trigger it automatically. It doesn't? No. So the five or ten lines of Python that I've started writing on the weekend is the next piece of that. There will be a small instance where you can go to a page and say, go get this file and mail me when it's back. Oh, yeah? What, what's the approximate lead time to get one of those old files back? Uh, after the request to restore it is three to five hours. Oh, okay. Three to five hours. Um, <laughs> which I think that's highly appropriate for something that is an archive and snapshot. Ah, bod. <laughs> if you'd seen the things I'd seen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's pretty good. Yes, another question in the back here. What about the interface around, let's say, say you wanted 100 packages of those that are really old? Sure. Can you do a bunch of them and say mail them when they're older? Can you do a bunch of them? I'm writing the Python now. Do you write Python? Well, a little bit. Good. I'm a, I'm a Perl hacker, so I have no idea. Let's sit down. <laughs> yeah, let's sit down and do it. Um, it's basically uh, an EC2 instance with a web server on it and a Python script which will go, call the API and restore these files. Now, however we want to do that is however we want to do that. The one thing I would suggest is we don't let somebody sit there and restore the entire archive. Um, you know, maybe if we let people restore a maximum of 100 files a day for all users or 1,000 files a day or whatever that is, that's probably appropriate because once they're restored, they'll be there for N days. You know, we restore them for 60 days, 90 days, whatever it is, long enough that people might uh, not have to restore them for a while. Any other questions? Yes, Russell again. Do we have a copy of this data outside of Amazon? Do we have a copy of this data outside of Amazon? Yes, we do. In fact, there are, there's currently the Wellcome Sanger Institute and there's another location which uh, name I can't remember. Um, but they were filling up and I don't know if there is yet a, uh, another, as in two locations. As it stands for durability in here of this data, S3 and Glacier both have the same durability. They both work by writing to multiple data centers, multiple shards in multiple data centers, and the bit that I really like is they're re-checksummed over time. It's not just data that sits there, static, suffering from bit rot. It actually is routinely checked. Even the archive stuff is woken up outside of you doing anything to validate it's still there, which is why the calculation is that everyone probably knows the number for S3. It's 11 nines of durability on the chance of losing any object in any given year. Um, it's pretty durable. If, if someone makes a mistake, there will be all hell to pay. Um, no, it's, I mean, we've never knowingly lost an object, and there's now over 3 trillion objects and request rates exceeding, I think it's 1.5 million requests a second against S3. So um, it's obviously done with um, great care and attention. Everything, as much as possible. Um, cool. So that's a snapshot. How am I going for time? Uh, you're doing well. You've got 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. Oh, sorry, 10 minutes. Damn, let's go quickly then. So the official demo image is on EC2. Um, this was what I started doing because I went, hey, we need to do something that's official. We need to make an AMI which is blessed by Debian effectively as being an official image. Um, because there was nothing. Everybody had made their own images. There was this uh, competing um, set of images of which no one had said, that is it. This is one from Debian that we, we acknowledge as being Debian. So I've tried to do this as openly as possible. Um, the script that generates the Debian AMIs is on GitHub. I didn't write the initial version of it. It was written by a guy called Anders Ingerman. Um, it was pretty extensible. It uses eucalyptus, or it used eucalyptus, I should say, to generate it. So we were using as much open source as possible to generate these images. Um, more recently, it's just flicked over to being a, um, based on Python. So it's using Boto, which is the Python library for talking to AWS. Um, but there are two ways now to get the, uh, the images that we've generated. Um, you can get them from the marketplace, so Amazon has a marketplace where you can buy commercial software or free software at zero markup. Um, and it's basically an index of software that's available to run on the AWS cloud. Um, or you can get it from um, the Amazon web services account for Debian that I've made up there. 
Um, and any Debian developer who wants access to that account, let me know and I will give you access. Um, it's, you know, even if you want to spin up a couple of instances and play with stuff, that's what it's there for. Um, I want people to be able to have access to this stuff and, and um, be able to try stuff out. Um, and it's available in all of the regions for Amazon Web Services outside of China, I should say now, um, since we opened in China about four weeks ago. Um, and I've managed to get this also into GovCloud, which is highly restrictive. I've managed to find a way forward. Russell? Why not China? Why not China? Um, I've not spoken to anyone in China yet, and China is ring-fenced effectively. Um, so I've got to work out a way that I'm going to um, find the right people to make that happen. It will happen eventually. Um, I've just got to, yes, negotiate that. Now, using an official image rather than fetching one from some random place that you think you are not charged to the network. Correct. It's already there. The, the official image is there. Now, one of the things some people do do is if, um, if there is an image which is outside of their personal control, so one from the, the Debian account, is you might want to cl effectively clone that into your account, in which case you do pay for the storage of that, but the life cycle of that image is under your control. So if you want to run 7.1 forever and a day, I will probably decommission 7.1 at some stage because there's 7.3 images there now. And there's no point in spinning up now a 7.1 image and applying two releases worth of uh, minor updates to it. Um, you might as well go to the most recent one. Okay. Um, so the marketplace looks something like that. That is the front page of Amazon Web Services Marketplace. And I am so happy that there's a swirl here um, on the front page. In fact, you've, many of you, have you guys seen some of the, the events that Amazon has run where there's you know, 10,000 people in an auditorium and they bring up this and you can see the Debian logo there. Yes, we're there. Um, so things are... <laughs> Sorry? Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's a work in progress. Um, so that's what the marketplace looks like. There's a longer description of what it looks like. And basically, yes, you need to agree to the fact that we have a social policy. Uh, that's, that's the license that's included in there somewhere. Um, the only difference of going through the marketplace versus going direct as a community AMI on Amazon is that you need to agree to our social contract. And also, um, because it's come from the marketplace, you can't do introspection on the root volume. Um, however, you can do it if it's from our account. It's purely because if it was a commercial piece of software, that's IP of the vendor. Um, in our case, that doesn't have to be the case. We would be more than happy to. So you can be more than happy to find either way to get to these AMIs. Um, finding the AMIs, uh, you can search now. We have an account number. That happens to be the account number we're using. This is all documented on the Debian wiki. Um, and in fact, more importantly, not just the wiki, there are signed messages in the Debian cloud mailing list. So you know you've got the right information from my key, and I'll happily sign anyone's key who wants it. Um, so uh, it uses this script. There's no call home in this script at all. It's completely silent when it comes up. We don't automatically apply any updates at the moment. That policy may change, and obviously it's the Debian developers that I want to have them say, should we be doing those updates automatically on boot? Um, there's times when you do, there's times when you don't. The most important thing uh, is that to log into these instances when they come up, there is a trusted user called admin. You cannot SSH as root, no root SSH. Um, and this is pretty common for most AMIs on, on AWS, is it's either EC2 user or Ubuntu or in our case, admin. And the reason admin was chosen is because we have all these derivatives. And instead of using the username Debian, um, which would then not make much sense on Mint or Steam or whatever else now is taken from us, um, this kind of made sense. Um, so up to and including 7.1a release, there was a 1a release because that's when we saw that we had some new host keys. Yes, you're asking? How does your key get into the admin account? It pulls it in. So when you are setting up your AWS account, you upload your public key to us. Your public key gets exposed to your host for it to pull down and put into the authorized keys of that host on boot. Yeah? Um, and that's what these scripts used to do. Fump. Hey, hey, exactly what you're saying. Your timing is impeccable, bud. Um, resize the root file system if you made the root file system larger than what it was, and execute any initialization script. So, Basically, there is this hidden metadata server. It's not very hidden. It's pretty well known. That that is where your instance can go and query information about itself and what it's doing, including getting your authorized SSH key for the trusted user that you then SU to root to get access for. Um, so this used to be a set of shell scripts, uh, and they were included under Debian, build Debian Cloud, all under an Apache 2.0 license, I think we said. Uh, yeah, ASL. Um, and after 7.1a, we have moved to Cloudinit. So Cloudinit is a project that the Ubuntu guys started to do um, basically more interesting structured information to pass to an instance when it starts up. Um, this has just gone live about three weeks ago um, for, with 
about, about a week or two after the 7.3 release went out the door. We've been testing Cloud Init. It's a Python package. Uh, and on boot, it does the same kind of things, but it's very extensible. You can tell it, here's a list of packages I want. Oh, and by the way, here's a shell script I also want you to run. And here's a bunch of services I want you to stop and start. Um, and so it becomes quite a, a nice way of doing it. And that's pretty much, I'd say, pseudo standardized between Ubuntu, um, Debian, uh, Amazon's Linux, which is a, a derivative of CentOS, uh, and I think CentOS now as well. Um, it's backwardly compatible, so if your metadata that you put still starts with hashbang BNSH, it executes a script. If you've got hash cloud config, it does cloud config uh, parsing of that metadata. Any questions on that? Yes, hang on, sorry, whoa, whoa race condition. I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna go with Alistair first, sorry, Adrian. Yeah, you could have. Yes, yeah, yes, definitely. Um, sorry, the cloud. Um, I saw the repeat. Uh, the cloud init program supports. What do you say? Parsing of. Well, I'm saying um, standard hash bang interpretation. Standard hash bang interpretation. Supports one argument. Supports one argument. Yes, yes, yes. Is there a facility to pull the machine's SSH key back in uh, back to you once it's been? Can you pull the machine's SSH key back to you? Yes, there is a way. I'm not currently doing it yet, but effectively, if you print the fingerprint of the host of the log, it does get picked up and therefore brought back to you. Yes, at the back. My question is more about various clients. So every time you put in a change this to the AMI, right? Yes, you ID it is. So how is there any way for me in the freight to launch the latest stable data image? Good question. How is it possible to find the latest AMI? Yeah, because every time we generate a new AMI, it's a new ID. There isn't an easy way right now. Um, it's something that, that the Amazon guys are very, very aware of um, and that every, you know, every three months you're looking for new Windows AMI because there's a quarterly update to Windows. Um, we're doing a new AMI. I'm trying to only do an update every time there's a Debian release. Um, that's what we're thinking. We're thinking of actually exposing that information as JSON somehow. But it would be manually done JSON, probably on the wiki, but maybe that's not... Um, secure enough, but yeah, because you don't want to be, be potentially trusting an external source to say, go and start up image number one, two, three, four, five, which happens not to be Debian, but something else which isn't trusted. Um, that's a really important thing. It's something that I, I am going to be looking at, um, but there's a few other things that I'm trying to knock off first. Um, so Cloud and it has been a big one. It's not fully functional yet at the moment. There's probably still a few little bugs in there. The reason why is because Cloud and it as a package in Debian is not in stable. It's in backports. So this is where we've actually made the first decision and said, we are going to include a backports package in the base Debian image because the functionality it gives us is much better than what we've got at the moment. Um, so there's an example of some of the configuration that you can do with it. And obviously on the Ubuntu website, you can go and find some more information about formatting uh, CloudInit uh, style metadata. Um, really useful. Um, obviously, these are probably good ideas to always do the latest updates and, and apply the latest security packages, um, but definitely not required. Question from Malastair. Um, just a security point. Uh, don't get too enthusiastic about this deploying keys to the admin or equivalent of user on M62 box because that has um, passwordless CD access because there is no password to the admin account unless you set one. Yes. So Alistair was saying that for, the, for the recording is that um, there's passwordless access for sudo from the trusted user to get to root. That is absolutely correct. Um, that's a default, and that is something that you could obviously change as soon as you've got onto that host. Just the way it's set up for initial access isn't the way it has to stay for, initial, for, for access over time. In fact, you might choose to join LDAP or something else like that after the instance has come up. Bod, so five minutes. No passwords There's only key access. Only key access. Very good. I'm going to have to scoop faster now. Um, so I said before, SSH is admin. It is an FAQ. Um, and then sudo to root. There is no remote root SSH, password authentication. Um, but you can change this after boot, which is all what I just said. You have full root privileges. AWS does not have privileges into your host. You can go and inspect the image if you want. If you want me to go and generate a tarball and stick it up on a website somewhere for you to download the image to it, so you can go and inspect it, more than happy to. Um, 
You run whatever you want, obviously, subject to the acceptable use conditions. The only conditions that I've found that have been interesting is you can't do broadcast, multicast, or promiscuous mode on your network interfaces. That's part of the security posture for AWS to try and uh, ensure that we keep things as secure as possible. I'm going to start to go faster now. The snapshots are marked as public, so feel free to inspect them, um, and you may want to generate them into your own AWS account to maintain control over their life cycle of that image. We will decommission old AMIs over time, just because we don't want to end up with 20,000 of them over time each time we have an update. Um, why do we put them in the marketplace? So they're discoverable by new users. Um, why from the AWS account? Because we can, um, and you don't need to worry about things like root uh, volume inspection. Um, the difference between them is, well, effectively nothing. It's the same AMI. I pass them the AMI they put into the marketplace. Um, so what are customers doing with those AMIs? Well, the ones that come from the AWS account, I have no idea because I don't get any stats back about that. The ones that go from the marketplace, I do get some subscriber information on it, um, but I do nothing with that because that's actually, I consider that as private. So currently, I'm the only person who's seen it. Um, but I have had some numbers come back from the marketplace team as to what it's been doing, and that's the kind of growth rate we've been seeing of adoption of Debian on AWS. Yay! Um, and that's a country breakdown that I've just done uh, about a weekend before last. So obviously a lot of people in the US, um, followed by Germany, the UK, Brazil, France, and Australia. Hey, we're in there. Um, and lots of others. Um, so why should you care about Debian on AWS? And that was one of the biggest things, is that uh, up until sort of middle, beginning of, of 2013, everyone was saying, well, we, we're not going to support any cloud vendors. We don't want to be on any of them. Um, well, for a lot of people, it's the first place they'll try and discover a Linux operating system. Um, they might not have the hardware experience to do it, but they're willing to try something that's free, um, at least initially, lowercase f. Um, and so uh, getting it up onto AWS as, as something that was blessed was a nice way of making it available for people to try it. Um, and of course, there are some large Debian users who want to fire up thousands of Debian instances to do analytics or life sciences or something like that, because we've got 40,000 packages in the archive instead of 5,000 or 2,000. Um, so I think it's a really useful thing. Um, we've had some feedback come back from customers. Um, these are all linked to from the uh, product page. And if you do get a chance to skim through some of those, uh, you'll see that there's, uh, I guess, one theme that comes out from all of these. And that is, we've been very open with this, and we've got a level of trust from people. Um, and I think that's one of the core things about Debian over time, is that people do trust us. Of course, firmwares up and below the hypervisor, I, I can't comment on. Um, obviously, we, Amazon does everything to be as secure as possible. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we could give bless Debian and be as open as possible with the way it's been generated. Um, so the life cycle of the images I talked about, uh, we'll try and keep Marketplace with the most current recent one. Uh, the AMI account, the AWS account that we've got, we'll try and keep the last point release from each stable release. Um, quick animation, and I'll try and be as quick as possible. In creating these AMIs, we fire up an instance. Um, we add an extra volume to it. Uh, we do a chaboot install, or chiroot install, effectively, into that, um, a debootstrap. Boom, unmount the volume, snapshot it, and from that snapshot, we then say register AMI, and we have an AMI, and of course, then get rid of the instance and the volume we used. And so we end up with effectively a snapshot, which is the eight gig of storage. Actually, it's only about four gig on disk, which it's actually charged for, and a registration information as to what kernels to boot up. Um, you can create PVM AMIs from register AMI, uh, a, uh, the register image API call. Um, but since the 2nd of August, you can now take, make HVM images, hardware virtualization. That gets you access to the bigger instances. And this is what I've been battling with Grub 1.99 for for the last couple of weeks to get it to register. Um, and I've just had a few posts get sent to me in the last three days. So I hope to have HVM images out in the next week or two, um, which will get us onto the GPU instances and things like that. The reason it's important is because you can see that these larger images, the instances down the bottom, um, with more compute units, so the compute unit is just an arbitrary scale of how much CPU power is in these guys, um, the bigger it gets, they're all hardware virtualization instead of power virtualization. Um, other things we've been looking at is instead of using block storage or persistent block storage for the root file system, using temporary disk as the root file system, we haven't got any AMIs out of our account yet that does that. A whole bunch more information is on the wiki. We keep updating the wiki every time there's new stuff. Um, the Debian Cloud uh, website, uh, sorry, mailing list has got lots of contributors on there. I'm not going to get to do the live demo, so I'm going to skip through that one. I can see you've stood up. Ah. Um, that was an article I was passed just before DevConf about people doing uh, protein structure uh, computation using Debian on AWS. So there are people doing it. Second last one, um, we're hiring. If anybody wants to come and hack on this kind of stuff, um, 
Uh, we've got people who want to do packaging in Seattle. If you're interested in working in Seattle, uh, come and do some Debian packaging there. Um, if you're interested in good operating system design to start with, um, we're looking to hire you. And also, if you're just interested in uh, using the tech, um, come work with us. Um, bunch more resources. Obviously, please use cloudfront.debian.net. Feedback any information you've got. Thanks goes out to Anders for his script, Charles Plessy and the guys for Cloud and It. Um, Lucas and, uh, and, and uh, Stefano for their support. Whew, I think we're just there. Thank you very much.